Good morning, everyone. What a delight to be here looking at you and celebrating love as we are. Uh, my name is Pam Worthington. In case you are wondering, I am not Alistair. If I were, I wouldn't be back from Cancun yet. <clears throat> we acknowledge with deep gratitude that we worship on the traditional unceded lands of the Lekwungen peoples, including the Esquimalt, Songhees, and other nations of the Salish and Coast Salish peoples. We recognize their historic connection and care of these beautiful lands, and we dedicate ourselves to restoring and renewing the relationship that our colonialism and colonization has broken. We, who came from many lands to join the line of those worshiping here in this beautiful church. We commit our church to continue the journey of truth and reconciliation with our First Nations brothers and sisters. By God's grace. And now I'm supposed to give announcements. <clears throat> there is a list, I'm glad you're sitting. Lorraine is trying to sell the last of her classic Girl Guide cookies. Uh, she said there are very few, so you'll have to rush back after the service. Six bucks a box. Uh, we Together Conference is a, uh, I don't know what that is, but it, the deadline for registration is tomorrow. Super Sunday, I've been to one of those. It's wonderful, and we'll have another one April 14th hosted by Jerry and Marilyn. Is Jerry and is Marilyn here? I'd love to see what, who, great, marvelous, it'll be wonderful. Ringing the Bells in the Climate Crisis, a two-part program uh, led by Patricia Lane, uh, April 4th, 17th and April 24th uh, at 7 to 9 p.m. in the Denson Lounge. Soul Collectives returns. Two sessions, one in person and one online. It runs for six weeks and the theme is, I love it, wonder. To register, call Carol Ann at the office or an email that I did not write down. <laughs> and beyond the walls, I asked the choir of what an organ crawl was this morning. I'd never heard of one but the RCCO Organ Crawl is celebrating International Organ Day of 2024 on the 20th of this month, 9.30 to 12.30 at the Church of Our Lord on Blanchard, yes, Blanchard Street. And the final one, and the most important, I'm not going to be singing a Sersen Corda. I just thought I would tell you. Just to uh, add a footnote to Pam's uh, very good announcement on uh, ringing the bells, uh, that those two sessions on April 17th and 24th have three purposes, to bring the good news about uh, what's happening to the climate uh, amongst the dire prognostications that we get almost every day. Uh, secondly, the crucial role uh, role of faith communities in preserving God's creation in a spirit of faith, hope, and love. And third of all, practical ways that this parish might develop of spreading that good news and taking action through the parish. So do, if you can, uh, join us on April 17th uh, and 24th in the Denson Lounge, 7 to 9, and our facilitator will be Patricia Lane, parishioner of 30 years, uh, vintage here, here at St. John's, uh, educator, a lawyer, mediator, and keen environmentalist. Thank you.
peace be with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. in Christ, for whom no door is locked, no entrance barred, open the doors of our hearts so that we may seek the good of others and walk the joyful road of sacrifice and peace to the praise of God, the source of all life. Amen. reading from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Hear what the Spirit is saying.
second reading this morning comes from 1 John, beginning at the beginning. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, and what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all and if we say we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness we lie and do not do what is true but if we walk in the light as he himself is the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sin, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Here, what the Spirit is saying.
for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of Christ. together to this locked upstairs room for what they're not quite sure, but they're scared. Actually, they're terrified, and they have right to be. Agitators, accomplices get the punishment of their leader, and crucifixion is as bad as it gets. There have been rumors that he's alive, but nobody believes it. And why should they? Dead people stay dead. And why had they followed him so impetuously in the first place? They had to wonder. The people he'd loved had spat in his face. His promised kingdom was nowhere in sight. Could the whole Jesus thing be just pie in the sky? And then, there he is, through the still locked door, nail holes and peace be with you to them all, except for Thomas. Thomas isn't there that fear-filled Easter night. He doesn't see the master's face and feel the gashes in his flesh. He doesn't believe them when they tell him, and again, why should he? Dead people stay dead. Last Sunday, I began my sermon with words every bit as shocking as today's. We've seen the risen Lord. 
I declared rather loudly, there is no hell. I said it twice, and a, a bunch of you shouted, Alleluia, also twice, which startled me because I wasn't expecting that. And after the service, a number of folk came up to tell me they agreed. But I knew others hadn't. And I know some don't. And I know some never will. And that is perfectly fine. Like a friend of mine, a lawyer and theologian in his own right, who later that same Sunday Facebook me the brilliant question, and I quote, How do you know? How do you know? Those of you who agreed with my statement, how would you answer Steve's question? I just answered, I know. I didn't try to explain, didn't offer any grandiose theological rejoinders, just, I know. Because I do know, deep down inside. That kind of faith you cannot give somebody else. You can't impart or substantiate, particularly with words. The disciples in today's gospel passage use words, of course. When they see Thomas a week later, they tell him, We've seen the Lord. And are we really surprised he laughs in their faces? Poor Thomas. Generations have dubbed him Doubting Thomas, as if doubting were some kind of failing or sin. I ask, who among us wouldn't take the offer to meet the risen Christ? or to experience a real miracle. I was taught, or was led to believe, that faith is essentially correct beliefs, and the operative word there is correct. I was led to believe that if I didn't hold the right, you know, quotation marks, the right belief, or or at least say that I did, that I would be corrected. Maybe even told God wouldn't be happy. They didn't teach this to be cruel. They taught it because they had been taught the same thing. And they were working hard to be faithful to the rules as they understood them. Fair enough. But doubt chipped away inside me at those b beliefs. Doubting Pam, you should call me. Bill Huzzar, editor of our wonderful Divine Connection publication, asked me to write a profile piece about myself as the parish's new kid on the block. And in it I mentioned that at the age of 17, I was bursting with big life. That's capital B and capital L, big life and big God questions. Typical feisty teen. My little Anglican church in the small town I grew up in offered very few big answers. But the Roman Catholics in the big church down the street had plenty of them. And some of those Answers were acceptable, though others, not so much. And eventually I left that flavor of Christianity, that denomination, to return to our own Anglican fold. A Christian flavor that when it is true to itself has always honored questions and doubts.
doubt. Thomas's? Yours? Mine? Doubt is anything but the opposite of faith. And if you have ever believed anything a preacher has told you, and be very careful about that, believe this. Doubt is anything but the opposite of faith. It is an essential part of life's faith journey. Most biblical characters expressed various degrees of doubt. Just think of good old Abraham. There's Job, Moses, Thomas, even Jesus. Jesus began his public ministry by saying, and I quote, repent and believe in the gospel. Sadly, the word repent has over the centuries taken on a puritanical connotation. It's much better translated as change, or even better, rethink. Jesus was announcing that he was going to challenge people to rethink, to rethink Torah, to rethink ritual purity laws, to rethink tribalism, rethink grace and compassion for the marginalized, even rethink love of self, of neighbor, of enemy. Believe the gospel is, that quote, believe the gospel, is much better translated as have faith in the good news. One of the signs of a growing, evolving faith, and faith, really it should be a verb, not a noun, it's not a thing. Faith is a process. One of the signs of a growing, evolving faith is an ability to integrate doubt to hold the tension between what we have been taught by others and what we have come to know as true for ourselves. Jesus was attaching the process of doubt and rethinking to the process of discovering faith. Because, you know, we can't have one, <laughs> we can't have one without the other. Belief is the insistence that truth is what we want it to be. In other words, that it fits our preconceived ideas and our preconceived wishes. Faith is very different. Faith has no preconceived conditions. It is rather an unreserved opening of a mind to the truth, whatever that truth might be. Belief clings, but faith lets go. Sometimes, admittedly, fairly reluctantly, but it lets go. Certainty which I really like to feel I know, you know, I've got it, is the very opposite of faith. Because if you think about it, rigid certainty invariably leads to arrogance, self-righteousness, and exclusivity. I'm right, therefore you must be wrong. And a wall comes up. All the great spiritual leaders, all of them were reformers. Rethinkers who, <laughs> rethinkers who dared to challenge long-held belief systems and to upset the status quo. Sometimes, yeah, dying for their efforts. 
The journey of doubt toward faith involves questioning. Questioning not just specific belief systems, but the whole belief system approach to faith. Let me say that one again, that's important. The journey of doubt toward faith involves questioning not just belief systems, you know, I believe in this and this and this and this, but the whole belief system approach to faith, because it's not about belief. Until we question, until we dare to doubt, to struggle, it's our parents, our communities, our church's faith, not our own. The late Archbishop David Somerville, a very beloved friend of mine, told my seminary class way back in 1982 a very true story about that very thing, about faith. He said that while he was yet a, a young parish priest, a mother in his congregation came up to him in tears about her teenage son. She said, and I quote, you know, Father, when Danny was little, he loved church. He went to Sunday school, was confirmed. He joined the youth group. He, he sang in the choir. He was an altar boy. And on and on. And then she stopped, took a deep breath, and blurted out, but now we won't go to church. And you know, Father, I think he's lost his faith. Archbishop David listened very intently and then very gently said to her, you know, Sandra, I really don't think your son has lost his faith. He's lost your faith. And now he has to find his own. We all have to find our own, however long it takes, and maybe a lifetime. It's not the destination that counts, it's a journey. Because until we find our own, it's somebody else's. Thomas was right on. He was a righteous example, not a faithless skeptic. I want to end with a selection that I borrowed from a book called <laughs> Doubt After Faith by Brian McLaren. In a beautiful chapter entitled, <laughs> You're Not Crazy and You're Not Alone, you'll find a kind of benediction modeled after Jesus' Beatitudes. The purpose of this benediction, to remind us, to remind me and you, that our honest doubts are not curses. Rather, they are blessings. Blessed are the curious, for their curiosity honors reality. Blessed are the uncertain and those with second thoughts, for their minds are still open. Blessed are the wanderers, for they shall find what is wonderful. Blessed are those who question their answers, for their horizons will expand forever. Blessed are those who feel foolish, for they are wiser than those who always think themselves wise. Blessed are those who are scolded, suspected, and labeled as heretics by the gatekeepers 
For the prophets and mystics were treated in the same way by the gatekeepers of their day. Blessed are they who know their unknowing, for they shall have the last laugh. Blessed are the perplexed, for they have reached the frontiers of contemplation. Blessed are they who become cynical about their cynicism and suspicious of their suspicion, for they will enter the second innocence. Blessed are the doubters. I count myself as one. For they shall see through fake gods. Small g. And blessed are the lovers. For they shall see God everywhere. And blessed is Thomas and all who care enough to wonder and to seek. And there is no hell. The very first Easter has taught us that life never ends and love never dies. We are the Easter people and hallelujah is our song. We respond to we raise our hearts to you, O God, with Lord, hear our prayer. O gracious and compassionate God, in this holy season of renewal, we give thanks for the gift of family and friends the ever-renewing beauty of creation, and all the blessings you so generously bestow upon us. May we show in our words and in our deeds the transformative power of your love, that others may see in us the hope to which your Son, Jesus Christ, has called us. We raise our hearts to you, O God. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh, gracious and compassionate God, show us the hungry and give us the generosity of heart to offer them food from our table. Show us the thirsty and give us the generosity of heart to offer them drink from our table. Most of all, grant us the generosity of heart to serve you by serving others. We raise our hearts to you, O oh God. Lord, O oh, gracious and compassionate God, who in your mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, grant us such knowledge of his presence in our hearts that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life to serve you in righteousness and truth. Guide us in the paths of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing to others. We raise our hearts to you, O God. Lord, hear our prayer. O gracious and compassionate God, comforter and healer to all those in physical, mental, and spiritual pain, we bring before you all who suffer a 
especially those who ask for our prayers and whose names are listed in our bulletin. We pray also for those whose names are written on our hearts and for those whose suffering is known to you alone. We raise our hearts to you, O God. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray today for the soul of our sister Ruth Peterson. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. And may all who grieve feel your healing in their hearts. We raise our hearts to you, O God. Lord, hear our prayer. O gracious and compassionate God, we pray for our broken world, that wherever your image is disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war or greed, its new creation may appear in the justice, love and peace of Jesus Christ. We raise our hearts to you, O God. Lord, hear our prayer. O gracious and compassionate God, in the Canadian Church we pray for Linda, our primate, for Lynn, our metropolitan, and for the Diocese of New Westminster and Bishop John Stevens. In our own Diocese of Islands and Inlets, we pray for Anna, our Bishop, and for the congregation of St. Christopher and St. Aidan, Couch and Lake, and their priest, Christine Mays. We give thanks for the clergy of our community of St. John the Divine, for Alistair, for John, and for Pam. Giver of all good gifts, make the ministry of our clergy a spiritual offering given with joy and grace. Comfort them when they despair, uphold them in their courage, and renew their spirits with your love. We raise our hearts to you, O God. Lord, hear our prayer. O gracious and compassionate God, as we begin the new week, we ask that you fill our hearts with gratitude for the opportunities that lie ahead. Help us to meet challenges with courage and treat others with the mercy and compassion you have always shown us. We raise our hearts to you, O God. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. You need to stand. You can't wish peace sitting down. Or maybe you can. <laughs> the peace of the Lord be always with you. Share that love. God's peace. God's peace. Turn him with
us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth. For by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word, and all things have come into being. You fashion us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy, and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of the angels in heaven, evermore praising you and saying, enthroned in splendor and light, yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love made perfect in our human weakness. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation, loving us to the end. He gave himself to death for us, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. On the night he gave himself up for us all, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He Drink this, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and all humankind for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection, his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high, and we long for his coming in glory. As we recall the one perfect sacrifice of our redemption, 
Loving God, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Look with favor on your people and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, let the oppressed go free and fill your church with power from high. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with all your saints at the table of your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, all vulnerable God, forever and ever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. of St. Augustine. Behold what you are. Become what you see. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Almighty God, we have seen with our eyes <clears throat> and touched with our hands the very bread of life. Strengthen our faith that we may grow in love for you and for each other. Through Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. We who have been blessed to be blessings to others, let the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes. Let the love of God be felt through your hands. Let the gentleness of God be heard in your words. And let the joy of God flow from your heart, you who are God's own beloved son, beloved daughter. And go forth in the name of the risen Christ, who empowers us all. Amen. <clears throat>